others weigh the fates of many men. And in my file, there are many stories of those who have broken the law. The story I shall never forget is about a man who wasn't a criminal, not in the strictest legal sense, yet who tried to live above justice. Martin Strang was one of the greatest criminal lawyers ever to appear before my bench. A man whose brilliant but tainted mind, and with almost diabolical shrewdness, cheated the forces of law and order too many times. Yes, this is the strange, bitter, ironic story of a man who gambled with life and death, and who put his thumb on the scales of justice once too often. The breaking point in Martin Strang's career undoubtedly came when James Tilton, the murderer once freed by Strang, struck again. It was early last summer. Strang had been at home to answer the call from Lieutenant Edwards at the Homicide Bureau that early morning. He wouldn't have seen his wife in the arms of Dr. James Anderson. And perhaps number 29, Euclid Arms, would not have been the setting for a weird and unusual crime. But what is done is done.
Yes? Are you ready for breakfast, dear? In a few minutes, when I finish shaving. What did you do last night? Take a sleeping pill? The door was locked. I tried to wake you. No, I had a headache. I went to bed early. You look like you had a rotten night. Not at all. Are you in a nasty mood this morning? You shouldn't be, you know. You're in the headlines again. Congratulations, darling. Musical murderer strikes again. Man acquitted year ago by noted criminal lawyer Martin Strang goes berserk. Killed boy and dog. I see that. Hello. Just one moment. Lieutenant Edwards, the Homicide Bureau wants to speak to you. Hello. Hello, Strang. Where have you been all night? I've been trying to get you for hours. Didn't get until very late, and I guess my wife didn't hear the phone. Why, what's up? Yes, I just read about it. Looks like a mess. Look, I'll take the Tilton case. What else can I do? I don't know, Counselor. Tilton's been asking for you. I don't think I'd like to be in your boots this time. What are you driving at? What's Doc Anderson got against you? Nothing that I know of. Why? He's pulling a fast one, Strang. He's asked for a private examination of Tilton at 8 o'clock this morning. If I were you, I'd just happen to drop in. Thanks for the tip, Lieutenant. I can just make it. I'll be there. You're not going to take the Tilton case again, are you, Martin? It isn't a question of whether I want to take the case or not. It's a question of ethics. The murdered boy, Tony Torreno. An acquittal for the murderer on a similar charge. Nice picture of you, Martin. John Tilton, the musical murderer. I doubt if you'll get any money out of him. He looks down and out. Isn't that a shame? An 11-year-old boy. Might have grown up to be a great violinist. He was crippled, Martin, crippled. A helpless boy and his dog. And you set free the man who killed them both. It's not very pretty, is it, Martin? I think it would worry you to free so many murderers. Doesn't it prey on your conscience? What difference does it make to you? Not, I suppose. I don't play the violin. Well, your client looks young. With you to defend him, he should be able to do away with quite a few innocent people before he dies. You've changed your hair, do, Lucille. It's quite becoming. You didn't answer my question. Doesn't it worry your conscience? No, not at all, because I'm a gambler. I like to gamble. If I don't take their cases, somebody else will. But I always stay within the bounds of legal ethics. You're a fine man to talk about legal ethics. You killed your own brother with those legal ethics. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Martin. 
Sit down. Finish your coffee. Found this in Tilton's pocket? Yes, it's a miniature conductor score, Beethoven's violin concerto. Yes, I know that, Lieutenant. What about the violinist? We made two wire recordings. One most children would study. The other, I think, is the one the boy was playing when he was killed. At least the music was on the rack. Excuse me, Dr. Anderson. Mr. Martin Strang is here to see you. Yes, he's taking the Tilton case again. Oh. Show Mr. Strang in. Come in, sir. Thank you. Hello, Marty. Jack? Have a seat. Thank you. Lieutenant? Hello. I stopped by the jail to see Tilton. They said he was over here. Where is he? Inside. You boys are getting to work pretty early. What's on your mind? I'd like to handle these cases as soon as possible after the crime. I have a theory about Tilton's. I'd like to try something on him, if you don't mind. What? Sodium pentothal. The stuff we started using during the war. Something we didn't have the last time you got Tilton off. Truth, sir. Well, <laughs> that's the popular name for it. The facts of the case point to a psychosis of some kind. With this drug, we can break down Tilton's defenses and make him talk. What are you looking for, Doc? A motive? Yes. You know as well as I do that testimony taken under the influence of drugs is not admissible in court. Yes, we know, but it'll save a lot of time. All right, if Tilton has no objections, I haven't. I doubt if he'll object. He looks pretty washed up to me. Shall we go ahead? Hey. Don't fight it, Tilton. Relax. Four. Five. Did your parents ever quarrel? No. They got along all right. Did your parents ever discuss money problems in your presence? Money problems? Financial difficulties. They had no financial difficulties. We had plenty of money. Enough money for you to study the violin? Stand up, please. Play for me. Isn't that you playing? Isn't that the way you used to play? No. My brother. The show off. Didn't you like your brother? Like him. I hated him. Why did you call him a show off? Thought he was smart. I knew music. He, he 
he was just a machine. A machine. He read the notes and played them like a parrot. No meaning. When I tried to tell him, he'd get his violin and play. Then he'd hand it to me and say, let's see you do it. He knew my hand ever since I was a baby. My hand couldn't play. I couldn't play. Beside you, Tilton. Tilton. There's a gun. Nice music. Good technique. That boy plays the violin beautifully. Just to show me I can't. They all do. They follow me around with their violins and laugh at me because I can't play. I can't play. I'm concerned, the man is as normal as you or I. What? I know it's a bitter pill for you to swallow, Strang. I shouldn't like your job of defending him. It'll hardly make you look like a public hero. Well, the man is obviously insane. The man has a neurosis, perhaps. He may have been out of his mind for a few minutes when he committed the crime, but in my opinion, he's sane. Well, I guess you know what you're doing. I'm sorry, Marty. Well, live and learn, I always say. I'll send for these later. Be seeing you around, Counselor. Yeah, goodbye, Lieutenant. Goodbye, Edwin. That was very smart manipulation, Jim. Even if it does put me on the spot, do you handle everyone that cleverly? <laughs> I've had a lot of practice. No hard feelings, I hope. No, of course not. It's all in the game. I was just thinking it's a shame your talents are wasted on a county job. Oh, my work gives me a lot of varied cases. It's good experience. I suppose so. You don't get to competition here. You're doing private practice. As a matter of fact, I intend to go into private practice very shortly. I'm a little fed up with all this. Yeah, but you'd miss it. Catering to a lot of tired dowagers wouldn't be very interesting. I don't think you'll give this up. I intend to. I wish I was as sure of myself as you are. You know, I used to be. To tell you the truth, these murder cases are getting the best of me. I, I don't even sleep well lately. Guilty conscience? Maybe so. Maybe you're right. You mean springing so many murderers? Look, if it's Tilton you're worried about, forget it. After all, you didn't hold the gun that killed the boy. I don't know. You know, Lucille keeps harping about my legal practice. Seems to be preying on her mind, too. I get strange thoughts sometimes. Like last night, I... Last night? 
What happened? Oh, nothing, really, except that I had dinner downtown. It was the maid's night out, and Lucille didn't want to cook. So when I got home, I found Lucille had locked herself in her bedroom. That was a funny thing. I knew she was in there, and yet I had the strangest feeling that I was alone in the apartment. I almost awakened her, to be sure. Did you? Awakened my wife? You don't know her. I'd have never heard the end of it. I guess I should have, though. I didn't get to sleep until the wee small hours. I thought you looked tired when you came in. Tired? I'm really tired. Say, Jim, you, you don't have any sedatives lying around that I could take at night, do you? I never seem to have time to get to a doctor. Well, I... I... Well, don't worry. Down and report you to the medical... Oh, it's not that, but the heat's on. So many suicides from sleeping pills lately. Oh, of course, I know you wouldn't be so silly. It's not a bad idea. But I don't think I'll do that yet. You know why? I want a big funeral. There wouldn't be many mourners. <laughs> Seriously, Doc, I, I've got to get some sleep. Why don't you go up to your place on the lake and relax? What you need is a good rest. All right. You fix me up with some sleep and I'll take your advice. Well, I, I shouldn't. But all right. at night. Thanks. Take care of yourself, Marty. Oh, I'll need to. Now that i found out my client Tilton is sane, I'll really need to. Give my regards to Dr. Freud. Strang threw away Dr. Anderson's envelope of sedatives with disgust. They had already served his purpose. The gun obtained by this ruse is now in the files marked Exhibit A, for it played an important part in the events that were to follow. Hello? You know, Doc, I don't want to stick my neck out too far, but I would like to take those two recordings to another alienist and have him examine Tilton. I don't think that'll be necessary, Edwards. After all, there's no use putting the county to extra expense. Well, it's your department, but that's what I'd like to do. Why don't you drop it, Lieutenant? I'll take the responsibility. Okay, Doc, if that's the way you want it. But unless I miss my guess, Strang will have another alienist on the case before the day's over. We'll see. what I want to talk to you about. Sure has, Mr. Strang. Twins. Boys. Twins. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's see. I bet you $25 it'd be a girl, I think. But twin boys? Well, that hits the jackpot. That ought to pay at least four to one. There you are. Congratulations. <laughs> a hundred bucks? Oh, you don't know how this will help me, Mr. Strang. You know, I needed $25 for my bond. It expired last week. Expired? Mm-hmm. That's serious, isn't it? Yeah, but this will take care of it. And the rest, boy, what that'll do for Molly and the kids. <laughs> you know, the boys in the department uh, have it in for you, Mr. Strang, especially since this Tilton case. But I know you're one swell guy. Thanks, Riley. Nice to know I got one friend left. Lucille? Lucille?
Marty. Didn't expect to find you home at this time. Anything wrong? You look worried. No, I'm... What are you doing with that? Oh, isn't it cute? And it works. Guaranteed to keep the children happy for hours. I think you'll like it. Who? Well, Johnny, of course. It's his birthday. Oh, Martin, I didn't think you'd forget. Not your own brother's little boy. How very thoughtful you are, Lucille, especially when the boy's father shot himself. Oh, of course. Oh, you'll have to forgive me. I, I just didn't stop to think. Where are you going? Out. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, yes, sir. -y. Practically giving these things away. Step right up. Step right up. Here you are, sir. You ever see a gadget like this? Here you are. Here, hold it in your hand there. Here. No, you pull on the trigger there. See that? See how it works? See the sparks come out of that thing? <laughs> Quite a gadget, isn't it, huh? Why don't you take one of the kids, huh? What's the matter? Haven't you got a quarter? Martin Strang had planned that day as he walked across the park. But a chance of him, only a few yards away, put another man into the game and changed the course, but not running. A murder trial involves many things, facts, people, and their emotions. On the day this trial began, it was hot, humid. The heat smothered everyone and everything like a strange, ominous robe. It was just as if the courtroom had set the stage for the weather. I looked at the prisoner. His name was in Jackson. The charge against him was murder. After the customary preliminaries in the courtroom, I opened the trial. William Jackson, 
You were charged with the murder of patrolman Patrick Riley, while said officer, in the performance of his duty, was attempting to make your arrest, said offense being in violation of Section 1141 of the Criminal Code, which states, Whoever purposefully and willfully kills a sheriff, constable, policeman, while said sheriff, constable, policeman is in discharge of his duties, is guilty of murder in the first degree and shall be punished by death. Before asking you how you plead, it is my duty to inform you that you're entitled to benefit of counsel. Have you an attorney? Yeah. Stand up. Yeah, I, uh, I got a lawyer, Your Honor. Is he present in this courtroom? I don't know. I... I've never seen him. He... He wrote me a letter. Well, uh... Who is he? My lawyer is Martin Strang. <laughs> also see if Mr. Strang is in the courtroom. That won't be necessary, Your Honor. Strang's appearance was completely unexpected. Public sentiment had run high against him when, only a few days before, he had appeared to defend James Tilton. But now, to voluntarily defend a man who shot down a public servant in cold blood was an insult to his profession that would place Strang in the contempt of... I was afraid you weren't going to come. I thought maybe you might change your mind or something. I said I'd be here, and I'm here. You still want me for your attorney? Sure, sure. Your Honor, have I permission to address the court? You have it. Thanks, please. Your Honor, I represent the accused, William Jackson. I enter on his behalf a plea of not guilty. And if it pleases the court, I should like the privilege of private conversation with my client before proceeding. Well, the proceedings are regular, Mr. Strang, but under the circumstances, your request is granted. The court declares a recess, one half hour. On, Jackson. <laughs> Now, before we do anything, I want you to understand one thing. I'll only say it once, so listen carefully. I'm not a charity institution, I'm a lawyer. I didn't take this case out of sympathy, I took it for one reason. I want something from you. I'm going to give you something, but I want something in return, you understand? Yeah, yeah, I understand, Mr. Strang. What is it you want? You're in a spot. You have a friend in the world. Nobody cares if you live, and the state wants you to die. They want you in the electric chair. They want to burn the light out of it. Now, you've only one chance in a million of beating this rat. And that one chance is me. But if you take the chance, you'll have to pay me. But not in money. I have something else in mind. I'm going to ask a favor of you. Sure. I know the fix I'm in. If you get me out of this, I'll... I'll even kill for you. You will? Yeah, I'll even kill for you. But don't tell me what you'll do. I'll tell you. You'll remember that. When the time comes, I'll tell you. You understand? Yeah, yeah, I understand, Mr. Strang. Hey, where is that Strang? Oh, you Quiet! 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 Favors, we just want to ask a couple of questions. Quiet. Yeah, Martin, we just want to ask a couple of questions. Look, we're bone dry on this. Quiet! We're bone dry. We got nothing on the guy. We got nothing on you handling the case. What's behind it? Why are you doing so it? The guy's broke? Look, we only want to ask why. Why? All why? Right, take it easy. I've never held out a story on you, have I? Not yet. All right, then, let's drop it for now. And I'll make you a promise. When this is over, you'll have your story. And more than that, it may be the story of my last case. You're kidding. No, this is no joke, believe me. All right, Jackson, come on. Ah, that string. I love that lawyer. He sure makes copy. If I only knew the story of this guy's strength. His mind is warped. He put his kid brother through law school and then had him disbarred. Yeah, just like sending him a tombstone. And the kid shot himself. Yeah. I've worked that guy in court case after case. You never know what he's going to do, but he's always got something up his sleeve. So? I got something in my pocket. Any buyers? Regard, Horace Greeley. Observe. See before your startled, naive eyes a pair of dice. In action. 
Hey, fellas, break it up and get downstairs. The place is busting loose. Look, dream boy, you're no redhead, and I'm rolling for dough. Come on, break it up. They're picking a jury. So oh, they're picking a jury. Dallas says I pass. Listen, Strang's letting the district attorney pick his own jury. No challenges. The DA's set to go. And moreover, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the state will show that this defendant, William Jackson, did willfully shoot and kill Patrolman Patrick Riley when that officer was discharging his duty in attending to arrest him. The crime that this defendant is indicted for is Section 1141 of the Criminal Code. In plain everyday language, the provisions of this code provide the state with legal, direct, rapid means of prosecuting to the fullest extent of the law criminals who shoot our law enforcement officers. Now then, in order to obtain a conviction, the state must prove two facts and two facts only. First, that the defendant did purposely and willfully shoot and kill Patrolman Riley. Second, that Patrolman Riley was a law enforcement officer in discharge of his duties. It then becomes your duty as citizen, Your Honor. Your Honor, I move that the case be dismissed. I believe your motion is premature, Mr. Strang. The district attorney hasn't concluded his address. On what grounds do you request I direct a dismissal? On the grounds, Your Honor, that the district attorney has already proved in his opening statement that the defendant is not guilty of the charge for which he has been indicted. Your Honor, I object. With due respect for my colleague before the bar, I feel that I... If I may interrupt you, Mr. District Attorney, you have stated that to obtain a conviction, the state must show that Patrolman Riley was an officer in the discharge of his duties at the time of his fatal shooting, have you not? Mr. Strang, the statement's in the record. Your Honor, I respectfully call your attention to Section 74723, which section states and provides that no law enforcement officer shall be deemed lawfully constituted until after having posted appropriate bond with the clerk of the court. Your Honor may satisfy himself by an examination of the records that the bond of Patrolman Riley expired four days before his death. And therefore, Your Honor, Patrolman Riley was not the lawfully constituted officer at the time of his shooting, and therefore, the accused William Jackson could not have violated the criminal section under which he has been indicted. Well, if we produce the records for my examination, I prepare a short recess for the purpose. If it pleases the court, that won't be necessary. I should like to produce in evidence, and for the court's inspection, this affidavit and true copy, which proves that the bond of Patrolman Riley expired, as I heretofore stated. As I looked at the records, I could see what must happen. Strang had found a loophole in the law, and a murderer was going to go free on a legal technicality, and I could do nothing. My hands are tied. The judge must follow the letter of the law. Strang's face showed what he was thinking. He used the law to evade the law. Upon examination, I find the records to be as counsel has stated. It is my duty now to proceed with this case with the facts as presented. No doubt the results of this case will be held up as a grave miscarriage of justice and in some quarters will be regarded as a violation of all precepts of moral right. From data and presentments known to me, I believe this to be an example of a man guilt of extenuation being freed, turned loose upon a society denied the protection which is the intent of its own laws but it is incumbent upon me to do only as the law dictates. No other choice is open to this court. So with full knowledge that the ends of justice are being defeated, I find it my duty to, and I hereby do, direct a dismissal of this case. Strang, I suppose, had a certain personal satisfaction. His client, Jackson, was free. Undoubtedly, Jackson was overjoyed. But I still wondered as I watched them. Strang most certainly knew the district attorney would obtain re-indictment, and I knew they'd be back. But not quite the way it happened. Sure you won't have a cigarette? No, no thanks, Mr. Strang. Well, I always say there's nothing like a good smoke after a hearty meal. 
And it was a hearty meal at that. The condemned man ate a hearty meal. Maybe that's a joke, huh? But I ain't condemned no more. You did it. You sure are a smart lawyer, Mr. Strang. Uh, very simple. First, I determined the facts of the case, and after that, it was purely a matter of law. You can never be tried again on that charge. You sure got the brains. Real brains. But I've been thinking. Why did you do it for me? Why? You're going to ask me questions? Well, I'll tell you one reason why I did it. Because I'm a gambler. I read of your arrest, and I saw that you were going to be brought up on the cop-killing statute. And I decided to gamble. And it was a gamble, Jackson. But when I gamble, I always bet on a sure thing. And I knew I had a sure thing. And I got off. I never thought it could happen. I've been in a lot of jams, but I never killed no cop before. I didn't think I could get away with it. It gives me cold shivers now to think about it. That's why did you kill him? You weren't in trouble. He was only trying to arrest you for a misdemeanor. Why did you shoot him? I... I really don't know, Mr. Strang. It's... It's all kind of mixed up. I can understand that. Sometimes I get mixed up myself. Even get afraid. Oh, I wasn't afraid. No? No, I mean that. I was strong. I was going to have a say in this deal. All my life I've been pushed around. I'm not a big shot. I'm just a little guy. Breathe on me and I fall over. I've heard that one, you know. They say, yeah, good stiff breeze and you drop dead. I'm just a little guy. And when I'm a kid, I'm a little kid. I get in a fight and I get beat up. And I come home. My old man beats me up. I get in a jam and I get sent to reform school. Then the guards beat me up. Mr. Strang, listen to me. I'm listening. I'm sick and tired of getting pushed around. I'm not going to get shoved in no more corners. When I get in the corner now, I get out. How do you mean, you get out? Oh, don't misunderstand me, Mr. Strang. You got me out this time, and I'm grateful. I mean it. I'd do anything in the world for you. You will? Sure. Good. You see this? I want you to put it on. You know what it is? Yeah, it's a straitjacket. Like, uh, like they put on crackpots. Insane people, like in an asylum. That's right. It's simple, but it's tricky. Here, I'll show you how it works. Hey, wait a minute. You don't think I'm out of my mind, do you? No. Well, this is part of the favor you're going to do me, don't you remember? Okay, if that's the way you want it. Anything you say. All right, let's get at it. <laughs> they tell me there's, uh, there's some kind of a trick to getting out of these things. Oh, there's no trick to it at all. I'll show you how to get out of it. First, you put your arm in the sleeve. I'll, I'll hold it for you. You know, I like to fool with things like this, Jackson. It's a form of relaxation for me. You see, all day long, I'm... Well, no, wait a second. No, your arm doesn't come out of the sleeve on this. Just push it in. All day long, I'm getting people out of trouble. There, yeah, that's what I mean about the sleeve, you see? I get criminals out of trouble. Murderers like you. Been doing it for years. Now, let's have this other arm. Men who kill people. It's quite an experience, I can tell you. Let's have the other arm. There, yeah, that's it. I guess I've helped more than a hundred men escape the chair. Sometimes I lay awake at night thinking about it. Oh, well, now, here's what you do here. Just fold your arms in front of you. That's right, so I can bring these straps around behind you. Over a hundred murders. But it's a gamble and it's exciting. I think I've gambled with just about everything in my life. Horses, money, cards. I've even thought of gambling with human lives. There we are, Jackson. It's a neat little gadget. What do you mean, gamble with human lives? Sit down. I'm just asking you. No, you ask. Sit down. 
But, Mr. Strang... Now, sit there. If you get up, all you can do is move around. You want to try it? What is this? This is your payoff to me. You mean all I got to do is just sit here? This is my promise to you? Yes. That's part of your promise. The other part is that you're going to play a game with me. A game in which we both win or lose. Both? You and me? Yes. If you win, I win. If you lose, I lose. What kind of a game is this? We're going to play roulette. With a revolver. Yes. I gamble with human lives. There was to be a third player. A certain Dr. Anderson. A most obliging gentleman, the doctor. This is his gun. This is his apartment. Very nice, don't you think? I toyed with the idea of the doctor getting the credit for anything that might happen here. But I guess it's best that we two play alone, just you and I. So the game continues, Jackson. Minus the third player. Just a game. Only a game. But I've improved on it. Now, strictly speaking, the way the game is played, a shell is put into the gun. The cylinder is spun. The hammer falls. Maybe it falls on an empty chamber or on a live shell, you see? Yeah, yeah. But we'll play a different way. You'll have more of a chance. What do you mean? Just what I said. Now, don't get up. Your hands are tied, remember? Just like the hands of the judge who set you free. Now I'm going to tell you precisely why I saved you temporarily from the electric chair. Have you ever looked at the moon? Did you ever look at it night after night after blessed night and wonder why you're doing what you're doing? Are you crazy? Why? Why, because I want to gamble with a human life? No. I have it all figured out in my own mind. That straitjacket. This gun. But why kill me? Why don't you just kill yourself if that's what you want? Why don't you just kill yourself? That would be suicide. No, I've waited for a case exactly like yours because... I want to play my game with a man who is legally dead. But you said I was free. Well, you are. You are, temporarily. But you'll be re-indicted. The state will get you for murdering a civilian, not for murdering a policeman. I could make a bet with you. I could bet you the indictment is already drawn. That's why I'm not wasting any time. If you live, we'll have a drink and shake hands. This is a gamble in which we both stand to lose everything. You can always win back money you've lost, but not a life. I'm placing my biggest bet. Put that gun away. It's just a game. It's a gamble. Half the shells in the bowl have the powder removed. Half do not. We'll take one. This one. We'll put it in the firing chamber of this gun. Now, just to show you, I don't know whether it's a live shell or a dud. You see the decanter with the brandy? Under the skull? You see? It was a dud. We might pick all duds. Look, Strang. I said I'd do anything. I said I'd even kill for you. Yes, you said that. I remember you said you'd kill. But you thought of killing someone else, didn't you? You didn't think you might kill yourself. I can't do that, Strang. I can't, I tell you, I can't. Nobody wants to die. But if your time's up, your time's up. It's a chance you've got to take. Now let's pick a cartridge. A little brass, a little lead. We'll stir them up. We'll pick the one you like. How about this one? You like this one? Is this the one we should use? No, Strang, no. You can't do this. Oh. Well, maybe this one. Or this one. How about this one, Jackson? Look. If you look real close, there's a little nick in the casing. 
Maybe I scratched it as I was removing the powder. Maybe. What do you think? Should I use this? No, no. You've got to pick one sooner or later, Jackson. And remember the odds. The odds are with you. 50-50 on the live or dead shells and five to one on the gun. You've got to take a chance. You've got to pick one. This one. Is this it? Oh. You can't do it. Then I'll do it for you. Stay! Now we're ready. This is what I've been waiting for. If I win this bet, I'll prove to myself that saving the lives of all the soulless, wretched, stinking bits of rottenness like you was good. If I lose, I kill you. And they kill me. And I'm ready. Are you? The shell is live. The shell is dead. The cylinder is going to spin. I'm going to spin the cylinder. Watch it, Jackson. You can't, Frank. You can't. You're crazy! can't take it, huh? You blacked out on me. I don't think you like to gamble, Jackson. You're no gambler. Gamblers don't faint. Well, it's all over now. You're all right. We're both all right. Come on now. Here. Come on, we'll have a drink. Ah, come out of it. We'll have a drink and shake hands. We'll I didn't know you were in. I'm just about to call the office. Well, really, Martin, what are you planning to do with that? What's the matter with you? Aren't you drunk? Well, I don't know about you, but this bores me. I'm going to bed. No. Now, we're going to have one of your usual dreary scenes. No, but... for once in your life, you're going to be an attentive wife. You're going to listen to an extremely sordid, but very fascinating case. You know perfectly well I'm not interested in your filthy case. But I'll listen. Apparently, I have no choice. This is a case you'll be extremely interested in, my dear. There's no money in it. Poor fool hasn't any. Then why take it? Why waste my time? I'm tired. I didn't say I was taking the case, but I might become involved in it. You see, I'm rather sorry for this fellow. Although he has to suffer for his part in this crime, it's quite clear that, that he was roped into his present position by a woman for whom I have the utmost contempt. He's fairly intelligent. 
Only a rather scheming woman of a certain type, such as the one we are about to discuss, could have, could have forced him into such an obvious trap. Trap? Yes. The trap you've made Dr. Anderson walk into. Now I know you're drunk. Don't be naive, Lucille. It isn't becoming to you. I've known about you and Dr. Anderson for months. I don't know what you're talking about. You know you've been the only one for me, but you've never had time for me. In all the years we've been together, has it ever mattered to you what I felt? That I could be lonely? That I might want to be something more than just Mrs. Martin Strang, a decorative asset to a successful career? Yes. I turned to Jim Anderson for companionship. Someone to talk to. Someone who at least treated me like a human being. It was that and nothing more. Martin. Martin, can't you understand? It was because I couldn't reach you through all these years and I turned to someone else for comfort. It was innocent enough. You must believe that. Oh, Martin. Martin, if you only knew how lonely it's been. I know. I do know. Darling. Darling, I knew you would. My poor sweet. Now you sit down and I'll tell you a story that will break your heart. This is guaranteed to put you to sleep. Once upon a time there was a kid. A nice average kid who who wanted nice average things out of life, like when he did something he thought was great, he could run home and tell his father about it and see his mother act like she thought he was a hero. Now, doesn't that just bring the tears to your eyes? And what's that got to do with us? I'm coming to that. He grew up in more ways than one. A struggling young lawyer with a nice shining goal before him. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But it didn't pay off. Not in money. The people whose cases he took gave him encouragement and affection. But you can't live like that all your life. There has to be that one person to rub out all the emptiness of being alone. So he met her. And she was beautiful. A little hard about everything he thought, but maybe that was just her defense against life. And he fell in love with her. In six months, he'd saved enough and they were married. The first year was wonderful. He loved her so much, he thought he was going batty with happiness. He wanted a son. But she told him they couldn't afford it. If he hadn't been so much in love with her, he'd have known then she was hedging. Pretty soon, he noticed a change in her. The small flat looked like a pigsty when he'd come home at night. And she always found something, something wrong. But she said it was nerves. And why, why didn't he get something that paid more? And he did. A lot more. He did a good job of defending one killer after another and became famous. And her nerves disappeared with that first mink coat he got her. It was then he suggested again that they have a child. This time she told him flatly that kids just bored her. And then he knew she'd never loved him. What's this got to do with us? It is us. Me king-size failure. And you, Lucille, a vicious, scheming little tramp. Shut up. Now you shut up and listen to me. I hate your soul. For years, I've hoped I never have to see you or touch you again. Yes, I love Jim Anderson, and he's ten times the man you will ever be. Do you hear that, Martin? Do you hear? Hear it. I think it's wonderful. You love him so much, and yet you were content to live here with me. You didn't even have the decency to ask for a divorce, my poor, cheap Lucille. You know what? You're insane. You're going completely insane. No, I'm not. 
but that's what you'd hope for. You'd hoped I'd go insane and kill myself. Follow in my brother's footsteps, didn't you? Didn't you? I'll tell you how sane I am. I've made a will, leaving everything I have to the families who have suffered at the hands of the rotten murderers I freed. Freed in my blind, stupid attempt to make you happy. Now get up. big moment, Jackson. Or is it Dr. Anderson's big moment? Yes. Yes, it is. This is gambling. Try it again, Jackson. That was one. Try it again. You're nervous. You amaze me. Dr. Anderson would love to be in your shoes. Or is he? Maybe. Maybe. We'll see. That's two. Now try... You're scared, Jackson. You look scared. Just like when you shot Riley. You're a dead man anyway, Jackson. You're dead. Don't lose your nerve. Three and four. Now it's 50-50, Dr. Anderson. It's 50-50, an even chance. Better luck this time, Jackson. Nobody's gonna push me around no more. Well, hello, Lieutenant. You're keeping late hours, aren't you? Well, that's my job. I didn't expect to find you here. I thought you closed at five on the dot. When did you last see Martin Strang? Why, when he was here on the Tilton case. Why? Jim. Oh, I beg your pardon. Oh, don't go, Mrs. Strang. I've been trying to locate you. Me? Yes. Do you mind answering a few questions? No, not at all. Uh, do you have apartment 29 at the Euclid Arms? No. Do you? Why, yes. I took it quite recently. Nice place. I didn't know you had that kind of money. <sighs> Maybe I have a couple of rich patients on the side. <laughs> a couple of rich lady patients, perhaps. Just what are you driving at, Lieutenant Edwards? Your husband was found there tonight, dead. I don't understand. I... Did he did he leave any kind of a, a note? A will. Oh. How could he? How could he commit suicide? Well, he, he had everything to live for. Well, he didn't commit suicide, Mr. Strang. It was supposed to look that way. The fact of the matter is, he was murdered. Where were you around 10 o'clock tonight, Mrs. Strang? I was at our mountain cabin. And I can prove it. I was here in my office all evening. But nobody saw me. Well, that's too bad. Because the gun that killed him was registered in your name. I'll have to book you on suspicion of murder, Anderson. I'm sorry, Mrs. Sterling. You'll have to come along, too. Oh, don't you talk. 
सच में Jackson was picked up by the police as he tried to leave town weeks after the shooting of Martin Strang. Again, I looked at the prisoner. William Jackson, the murder of civilian Patrick Riley. You have refused counsel, and I now ask you, how do you plead, guilty or not guilty? Guilty, Your Honor. But not all fates are weighed on the scales of justice. As William Jackson waited in the death house for execution, he confessed to the murder of Martin Strang. But his confession came too late. Doctor Anderson had killed himself three days before. Martin Strang, the unloved, feared, hated. His was the story of waste, waste of a mind misused. You have seen his last, most destructive hour. God rest his soul, and the souls of all those who lose their way. Oh.